Good morning. I'm Lucinda Johnson. I'm part of the uh, program committee, and it is my distinct pleasure um, this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Volpe. Um, he is the executive and founding director uh, and founding board member of the Science Counts. Um, I can't think of an organization that um, is more important to us in this day and age. Uh, we just have such a crying need for this kind of information and this kind of action. Um, science Counts has a mission of deciphering America's complex views about science to de develop more effective ways to foster grassroots support for scientific research and exploration. And Dr. Volpe got his PhD from Scripps uh, Institute of Oceanography, so he should feel um, extremely welcome here, but let us um, welcome Dr. Volpe today. He's going to be talking to us about America's view of science separating fact from fiction. I don't know about you, but I'd like to watch more of the Mercury dancing around videos. That was awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts and some data about public attitudes of science. I'd especially like to thank John and Debbie for inviting me here. Um, it's, it's a real honor. It's a real ple a pleasure. I, I think it's an understatement to say that we live in interesting times. And I know for many of us, we go to kind of a political world when you hear me say that. But I'm thinking about it even more broadly culturally. I mean, with our technology, we are creating a world of instantaneous gratification. I have a 16-year-old who just got his driver, driver's license this past weekend. And the state of Texas evidently trusts him to drive a one-and-a-half-ton vehicle at 70 miles an hour. But my wife and I were reflecting that here's a human being who has never known a world without a search engine, Google. Here's a human being who grew up in a world where the minute you want to buy something, you go to Amazon and you get it. The minute you want to look at a video from a movie that you've seen years ago, you go to YouTube and you watch it. And the minute you want to say something, good or bad, about someone else or something else, you've got social media to say it. And so here we are as scientists in a world that is becoming more and more about instant gratification. And yet science by its definition is supposed to be systematic, methodical, and frankly it moves somewhat slow. So it's not a surprise that we're seeing on multiple levels somewhat a tearing of the fabric between science and society. And the question is what if anything we can do about it. And so there are many of us, many of you I think as well feel the need in terms of how do we build bridges across this widening chasm. So what I want to do here in the next few minutes is give you data, give you a firm foundation of, to the best of our knowledge, how Americans think about science, the lay public. Before I begin, a few disclaimers and warnings. The first, a colleague of mine who is a very serious scientist said to me once, you've become this embodiment of an unholy alliance between science and marketing. What he was meaning is I, I did have the pleasure, it's a terrific place, to get my doctorate at Scripps. I am an atmospheric chemist and a geochemist. I studied stable chlorine isotopes in the boundary layer and up to the stratosphere in the 90s when CFCs were, were quite the hot thing. Um, but I left academia afterwards, and I became a little bit of a serial, small-scale entrepreneur and marketer. So I've been doing marketing for, for 20 years, and to many of us in the sciences, that word marketing is a dirty word. And it's a dirty word because we, we assume it means advertising or promoting. That's really not what marketing's about. It's a tiny sliver. Marketing is a complete life cycle which starts with observing the world, assessing a need, developing a product or a service to address that need, delivering it, and then evaluating how it went goes back to the beginning. If you think about that, that sounds a lot like the scientific method because it is very similar. Desi different desired outcomes, but similar methodology. 
And so I'm here to tell you, if nothing else, that we as scientists could learn a lot from marketers, true marketers, not bad marketers, true marketers in terms of engaging the public in science. So I'm going to use marketing words is basically why this is a disclaimer, so please don't run away. Um, I'm going to show you some data, and just so I don't have to say it over and over again, the data that I'm showing is strictly for adult American public. That's not to say that the rest of the world is not important. It is. But the U.S. federal government is the single largest funder of basic science research on the planet. And I live here too, so it seemed like a logical place for us to start trying to figure things out. And then finally, what I'm going to show you is a real high-level cursory examination of what we have, just to kind of give you a sense of where things are, clear up a couple of myths. Uh, if you want to know more, I have a website and an email at the end that you certainly can go and probe more deeply. Okay, so I'm the executive director of an organization called Science Counts. I did not found it myself. It sort of came about through a confluence of several events in 2011, 2012. One of those events was a meeting hosted by the American Physical Society of some folks, you might recognize some faces here. This was done at the World Science Festival. And it was a, it was a group of somewhat the, the cult of personalities in science communication. You see Alan Alda, for those of us who are old enough to know who Alan Alda is. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, next to him is Ira Fladow from Science Fridays. If you don't know what Ira looks like, that's him. And a few others, Phil Plate, et cetera, et cetera. And they got together, this was 2012, and they had a sense of two bad things were happening. The first bad thing was that despite their best efforts, they were losing a large fraction of the public. That the public, at least around science, was dividing. Um, the other concern was the fact that they sensed, and there were some policymakers in the, or not policymakers, uh, science advocates in Washington, felt that Congress um, was not likely to champion science as much as it had in the past. And this is 2012. Okay. Around the same time, a shocking, jarring study came out. This was uh, commissioned by 12 science societies and uh, scientific associations, which posed the question to Americans. If you had to, you can't read it, it's okay, I'll tell you. If you had to cut one federal program to reduce the deficit, which one would you cut first? And they gave eight choices. And in 2011, the number one choice was scientific research. This was also done again in 2015, and again, the number one was scientific research. Okay, that's concerning. Now, one thing to note is halfway down, you'll see medical re research. The folks who did this, I think, did a very smart thing. They separated medical from science. And so people get medical research, but evidently scientific research, not so much. So how could this be? Because we know that Americans generally really like science. So how can you like something but be willing to sort of cast it to the wind um, if you had to? The third confluence that came together was uh, some groundbreaking work by a guy named Dan Kahan. He's at Yale. Uh, he does a lot of science communication research, especially for climate. And Dan did a study which showed, um, it basically it was to, to correlate, to test the theory that if I taught someone more science, if they had a greater science literacy, they would get it more. So with the, the issue of climate, if only we could help Americans understand climate better, then they, everyone would come around and understand that in fact there is real climate change. That was sort of the hypothesis. Now, what Dan found is for most issues, certainly rudimentary issues like what gas do scientists believe cause temperatures in the atmosphere to rise? What you see is on the x-axis, as people's scientific literacy goes up, and you can measure that, by the way. There's NSF, basically an NSF quiz that determines scientific literacy. As it goes up, you would expect people to answer that question correctly more often. In fact, that's exactly what you see. And for most scientific issues, that's how it works out, except for the controversial ones. Climate, GMO, a little bit of evolution, vaccines. So now contrast it to this. Here's a question. Is there solid evidence of global warming due to human activities such as burning fossil fuels? Again, you might expect that as people knew more, they would say, yeah, there is. And in fact, that's not what you see. What you see is as people actually know more science,
they bifurcate along political lines. Now, if you remember nothing else about my talk, just know this. One's political ideology is the number one determinant on how you look at science and what issues you are for or against. Number one, socioeconomic status is number two. Gender and race are a distant third, okay? And so what this figure is telling us is what marketers know all the time, but this is new to scientists because we got to kind of figure this out for ourselves. We don't listen to anyone else. And that is, guess what? People don't use scientific evidence and their knowledge of science to reach a conclusion. They reach the conclusion first, and then they use their knowledge of science to defend that position. And whether we like it or not, that's kind of how the world works. Okay? And so this was a wonderful study to sort of quantify that. So that's what we're working against. So let me go ahead and clear up some facts and fictions here quickly. So, statement. Americans' interest and appreciation for science is eroding. Is that true or false? Fact or fiction? It is absolutely fiction. Americans, in fact, you could argue, are at an all-time high in terms of how much they appreciate science, how much they consume science through entertainment, it's big business, lots of movies, lots of cable channels, okay? This uh, chart here is showing data from NSF science and technology uh, indicators. And basically, if you can't read it, that is okay. These are small. Blame the NSF, not me. But this top blue line is people who say that science um, is uh, essentially a net good. It's about 70 to 80 percent. This goes back to 1985 to present. So it's dead flat. Okay, so it's certainly not diminishing. And there's dozens of studies that say Americans like science a lot. Okay. So then, how can Americans like science so much but be willing to cut funding? And that was the first thing we at Science Council wanted to look at, and we found two big clues. The first is we found through a national survey that less than half of Americans believe that if the U.S. lost its leadership in STEM, it would have any effect on their lives. That's shocking. And in probing more deeply, the reason many of them feel that way is because they believe the U.S. has already lost its leadership in STEM. And their lives haven't completely turned upside down, so therefore it must be true. You know, they hear stories over and over again about how the United States is ranked 28 in terms of science education and all this. And so through all that consumption of data, there are a lot of Americans who believe that we no longer lead the world in STEM. The other finding, and this is a real concern for people who worry about funding, is that only one in four Americans believe that um, government funding is necessary for scientific progress in this country. Three out of four believe that if the government stopped funding science, the private sector, philanthropy, and Elon Musk would solve all the world's problems. Okay? Now, that is not the case. The numbers don't work out that way. In case you've forgotten your who funds what slide, um, this is basically showing here funding for basic science research in the U.S. The blue line is the federal government, which now, this is 2015, this goes up to over 41 billion now, okay? Private sector is the red line, philanthropy and academia are around 10. So the federal government funds a little bit more than half of all the basic science research that happens in this country. If that goes away, the other three are not going to be able to step up. Okay. Second sense. Americans trust in scientists is eroding or diminishing. It must be because here we've been yelling about climate for 30 years, lots of scientists, consensus, and yet a third to half of the population doesn't seem to agree. Well, it's fiction. By every measure, generally speaking, Americans think scientists are incredibly trustworthy and all around awesome people. Again, this is data, whoop, I think I, there we go. Uh, this is data from NSF, and just to navigate you, this orange line is trust in scientists from early 70s to present day, okay? Almost, trust in almost every other institution has decreased in that time. If you're a journalist, you're crying right now because Americans don't trust journalists or the press just about any money anymore, okay? Everything's dropped, financial institutions, et cetera. The only exception is trust in the military. Trust in the military has actually gone up, sort of the post Vietnam guilt. 
And in fact, these spikes correspond to the first Gulf War and then the invasion of Iraq in terms of supporting the military. Okay? So we're doing pretty well as far as trust. That's not what's going on. What's actually going on is that the public is suspicious about scientists' ability to navigate the waters when it comes to their research and how it lays with the agenda of their sponsors. So another way of saying that is that there's concern that the scientists are just pawns in a larger political system. I don't blame climate scientists for what they say if I'm a conservative Republican. I blame Al Gore. Al Gore is just sort of manipulating and taking advantage of the scientists. The scientists mean well, but the political apparatus is actually what's at fault here. Okay. So I've given you broad strokes. Do we actually have to go in the weeds, though, to really understand what's going on and do something about it? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely you do. Um, those statistics I just showed you, frankly, are meaningless. So it's OK. You have to really understand what certain pockets of the population are saying. So I'm going to show you a, a plot here which may hurt your eyes, but it's really important. And so let me navigate you through this. Uh, this is the results of a survey we've done. And what we did was we posed the question, OK, we picked an issue, in this case it was the environment. Do you believe the environment should be an urgent focus of scientific research? We've stratified, so it's easier to read, liberals, moderates, and conservatives. So that's blue, lavender, and red. And then on top of that, we've broken out people by their formal education. And so the polygons are actually breaking up each group into uh, different levels of education. And the key is here. Now, to save you the pain of having to go back and forth between the key and those dots, just know the more sides your polygon has, the more education you have. So squares are more educated than triangles, and high school or less is circles, okay? So here you see when it comes to the environment, liberals, about 55 to 60 percent, feel strongly. It's urgent. Science and the environment. Conservatives, not so much. Not a surprise. And education doesn't play a big role here. Pick another issue. National defense, the role of science in national defense, here you see the reciprocal. This is an issue where suddenly science is really important for conservatives, okay? A lot less slow for liberals. And here you see the secondary effect where within each political ideology, it is those with a lower education that feel more strongly about this issue than those with higher education. You can speculate why. Who's serving in the military? It's probably more of the folks that are circles than squares. Okay. Looking at just a couple others, and we have dozens of these, and I'm not going to drag you to them, but this is where, the, for, for those of us who are trying to engage the public, the data is really actionable. This is a very unusual one, um, the disabled. The urgency of scientific research in helping the disabled. Here's a case where your p political ideology doesn't have any effect. All that matters is your education. And you can see those with less formal education care more about how science affects the disabled versus those with higher education. And again, I can't tell you why, but I would speculate, you know, here are folks with desk jobs, higher education. Here are people who are more likely to work with forklifts and other things. And so you care. The, the odds of being disabled are greater. And then finally, just the last one, this is the go-to for any science communicator. We all know this. In fact, it's frustrating for those of us like ocean scientists Give me an example of why science matters in our lives. Everybody picks something medical. It cures a disease. It helps an affliction. Okay? Um, and so you can see that is the one issue in science where everybody, regardless of political ideology, education, or anything else, says that really matters. Science really matters when it comes to health and medicine, which is why it's a go-to for so many campaigns. All right. All of this kind of made us wonder, when we say science, what do people actually hear? If I go say the word science on a crowded public bus, what do people think? What do they feel? What do they hear? Maybe we, we kind of just got that word wrong. Maybe we're missing a point. Now, if, a, if you were a marketer, we would say we're trying to figure out what the brand of science is, OK? And so. Why does brand matter? Why does this question even uh, mean anything? It matters, and I'm going to break a rule. I hate writing a lot of text on slide, but this is important text. Okay, when I say brand, here's what I mean. Brand identity is the emotional, sensory, and cognitive reflex 
experienced when a person first encounters an object or idea. And the reason it's important is brand is an unspoken starting point. It shapes personal intuition against which all subsequent information is gauged. It's this red part that's huge, okay? So when I, for example, say cactus, most of us probably think the color green. We feel prickly. You probably feel more hot than cold, and I'll bet you it's daytime. You're prob probably not imagining a desert at night, most of us, okay? That's sort of what we're getting at with brand. Here are some common commercial brands. Harley Davidson. Does anybody own a Harley? You don't have to admit it in here if you do. <laughs> but if you do, you can come up to me afterwards and tell me if I have this wrong. Har Harley Davidson does not sell motorcycles. That is not how this works. What they do is Harley sells freedom with attitude. You buy a Harley because you're buying into that. That's what we're talking about when we say brand. This is why all Harley Davidson commercials are, you know, in some wide open space, in some national, you know, uh, uh, some national park, you know, with no traffic. You will never see a Harley ad with someone stuck in like the Beltway around Washington in, tr you know, bumper to bumper traffic with the rain and bugs in their teeth. No. Okay. Let me give you another example. I'm not a big Steve. I, I, I never knew Steve Jobs, so let me say that. I only know what I've heard. I'm not a big fan of him personally. I don't think he was the nicest human being from what I hear. But he was brilliant. He understood marketing really well. And so Apple, what's the brand of Apple? This is an old Apple commercial that ran in the late 90s. Apple is not selling you technology. Okay, now it's a little different. But back when Steve was running the show, Apple was about irreverence with style. Okay? Apple was actually a fashion company. And so you bought into a fashion community just like you would buy a coach bag. He got it and he built it. We got to do the same thing. Okay? This is what I'm getting at. So when we say science to the rest of the world, not scientists, because we're a self-selecting bunch, but to the rest of the world, what is it that the rest of the world immediately feels, thinks, and hears? Because we got to know that if we're going to start telling them a story or take an adventure. And so we studied that. And I think that's probably the most significant contribution that Science Counts has made to date. And so very quickly, let me show you what we found. The first thing you do in a brand analysis is you do word association. And so we ask people and we test, what words, you know, do you positively or negatively associate with science? Not any specific kind that's getting into the weeds, just science. Well, here are the words that people positively associate with science when they're describing what science is. Discovery, curiosity, invention. Invention's funny, by the way. It depends on who you talk to. If you talk to men, especially lower socioeconomic men, they like the word invention. If you talk to more educated folks, especially women, they like the word innovation. A lot of us use those two interchangeably, but there's differences there. You got to know this, okay? Optimism and youth. Youth was a surprise to us. Hmm, it's an important clue. Negatives association, these are a lot of words that you use if you're in Washington talking to congressmen and women about why science is important, which may work for them, but these do not work for the general public. Investment, competition. Competition was wonderful. If you want to turn off highly educated white liberals who are the core of supporting science in this country, NPR listeners, okay? You want to turn them off, talk about competition with science that runs completely orthogonal to how they think about science. To them, science shouldn't be about competition. Science should be the thing that brings humanity together. We should all be working together and cooperating. Interesting. Budget, funding, grant. So anything having to do with money or accounting is a wonderful way to turn people off when you're talking about science. Okay, and so here's this, and I'm almost done. I'm here to tell you that the brand of science is hope. When we say science, the public hears the word hope. They feel hope, okay? Let that sink in for a minute. When I say hope, what I'm meaning is the Americans see science as a path to a better tomorrow. It's a means to an end. It is not the end. Science is useful for what it gets us, okay? It needs to serve the greater good and that last part is really important, and this is where a lot of scientists don't like this slide. Because a lot of scientists, science is a process of inquiry. That is not how the majority of the public sees science. 
Science is for what it produces, its payoffs. If you can't tell me why science is actually going to result in something that's useful, I am not interested. It's that simple. Okay. And so I'm here, and if you're someone who's thinking about doing science communication, or has been doing science communication with the public, I would leave you somewhat with this thought. We're not in a classroom. We're not the professor, and the world is not students. They're not sitting there wanting to hear what we have to say. We are in a marketplace, and we are competing with ideas and people's attention. And so we have to recognize that the picture on the right is wrong. That is not the real world. We are not the, the person in the front of the room. Okay? In fact, the picture on the left is correct. And in fact, who are we in that picture? We're the produce. <laughs> We're not even the people shopping. People are sorting through us. We live among consumers. And consumers like the right to choose. And that's why Americans are perfectly OK by saying, I am pro-science. And uh, so I reserve the right to think climate change is happening because of the science. But uh, one second later, I reserve the right to say that GMOs are terrible because of the science. I have the right to pick and choose, issue by issue, what, when science is convenient and when it's not convenient. Because of, as you saw with the Dan Kahan thing, okay, we often use our science to defend positions that are rooted in other places. All right, so something to think about. Uh, so in terms of things that we need to do collectively, we need to talk benefits, not features. You do not sell a red convertible by teaching people how a combustion engine works. You say, imagine, it's Friday in San Juan. You've survived the conference. It's a beautiful day, and the wind's blowing through you, and you're going to eat amazing Puerto Rico food. This is the world we live in, OK? That's how people look at science. We need to make, and this term is really important, value propositions. I need to show you, the general public, how what I care about matters to you. Simple. We don't do it effectively, not consistently. And then, frankly, we just need to understand that we are no different than every other source of information out there. Uh, a lot of scientists think, well, we're kind of above everything. We're science. No, that's not how the world sees us. We live in a consumer-driven world. We're just one source of many sources of information. And so we have to compete. Uh, we just want to, I want to acknowledge the many philanthropies Professional Science Society, CSSP, AGU, that's made our work possible. There's some industry there, Johnson & Johnson and Elsevier, uh, Independent Lab, Cold Spring Harbor. We're trying to bring together a community to really crack this nut. And I just want to thank everybody for your attention on this Thursday afternoon. And I'm, to the extent we have time left, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Let me say again, I just gave a superficial outline. If you want to learn more, and we actually have a couple of reports coming out soon, later in March, feel free to, we'll push the information on you. If you want to just write that email and email us and say, send me more, and we'll be happy to do that. Thank you very much. We turn the microphones on, the floor mics. I use the switch. Or he can come up here and talk in mine. That's okay. Yeah. And uh, you pointed out what uh, Francis Moore LePay has said is that uh, we don't believe what we see, we see what we believe. Uh, but is that true for everything, or is that only true for things that we have a particular stake in? For example, everybody should know now that if you eat animals, you're likely going to get a heart attack at some point in your life, or it goes way up, right? Yet people don't want to embrace that data because it changes the way you know, they have to live. Has there been studies done which uh, relate how meaningful it is to a per person's life 
as to whether or not they embrace a scientific fact. Yeah, your, your point is, is exactly right, which is when, when you have a, a greater vested interest in an issue, when the stakes are higher, that's when this turns on. So if it's some random facts, like what's the fourth planet in the solar system, no controversy there, it doesn't affect me. But when it would affect a change in my behavior, then, then, then it really matters. And the social scientists you know, sort of have cognitive theories that are beyond me to start unraveling this. As a practically oriented guy who wants to do this, I would say, you know, in this country, corporations spend between 200 and 300 billion dollars a year trying to understand this, branding and such, and they know a lot. So you're right, your point is, when it, when it, affect, when it would require a change in my behavior, then, in, then it's a totally different game. And, and how to navigate that is exactly what we and others are trying to do and apply that. Um, but a word that is missing from the conversation and how to do that is grace. You do it gracefully. Forcing facts down people's throat, if it doesn't work. I think we have ample evidence around climate to show that and other issues as well. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the talk. Uh, I especially appreciated the message that science is hope. I think a lot of us got into the field for that. Uh, but yet we're also now dealing with things that don't give us a lot of hope, right? We look at very scary trends on the world. And so I'm sort of curious, I'm, I'm also reflecting on uh, a campaign in 2016 you might have witnessed where fear was a big part of what got people motivated and got to an end. So I'm just curious if you could reflect a little bit on kind of when is it appropriate to scare people and when do you have to use hope? So I, I could speak to that as a parent of three kids. <laughs> I use it every day. Great question. Uh, there's actually two questions in there. So the first one, the second one's easier. Fear, I, I, I don't have an extensive political background, but I work with people who've run campaigns. Fear is a great way to motivate voters and people to do something for an acute period of time. It is very hard to sustain it. And so you can get people to sort of vote or act out of fear in a knee-jerk reaction, but then it goes, I mean, you see this with nutrition. How many people have crashed diets, have a heart attack, give up meat, and then three months later, they're eating it again, you kind of have. So, so hope is where it is long term. The, to say that the brand of hope, uh, or I'm sorry, the brand of science is hope, what we're saying is that as scientists, people expect us to be deliverers of hope. And your question is, is, is exactly right. We don't always have good news. So how do we reconcile that? Well, I'm here to tell you, we have to give bad news when we have bad news to give. And certainly there's a lot at this meeting. But that's the first shoe. We, you know, if you want to really connect, people are going to say, OK, yes, the planet's dying. So tell me, what can we do? And it's, so the hope comes with the, OK, I've identified a problem. Here's, how, here's what we can do. Here's how we can solve it, OK, and how to communicate that effectively. So please don't walk out of here thinking when I say science is hope means you should, everybody, all our messages should be peach and cream and rosy and happy. That's not what branding really means. Um, what we're saying is that, we need to deliver a hopeful message, but there can be bad news along the way. But then we need to help people. You know, we can't just say, well, bad news, now it's someone else's problem to solve. We need to be active and being constructive on how to solve it. And that's really hard to do. So um, a lot of ASLA members are not um, from America. And, but there we're seeing a rise globally of national move, nationalism and conservative movement. Have there been studies like this, say, in Europe? Are they seeing the same type of thing in terms of a science brand? Is there, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, there, there's bits and pieces. Um, I think it's, I'm going to say here, uh, you know, in public, that I think the science is hope message is one that's probably pretty universal. But the challenge is that's only half the picture. Science is hope, but different people hope for different things, right? So we can all say, yay, science is hope. But the reason liberals look different than conservatives is they have different hopes and dreams and expectations of what they want the world to look like. So, Debbie, to your question about internationally, which you're really talking about country by country, it will, de it will depend a lot on the local cultural issues and what are the intrinsic values in those countries in terms of how science lays over those issues. Yes, sir. So you said that trust in scientists is stable but trust in the media has been going down. A lot of people get their science from the media, so how do you separate that? 
uh, well, <laughs> the answer could be avoid the media, but I'm not going to say that. No, it, it's that um, you know we live in a cynical and skeptical world. We just did a digital test campaign to test messages, and almost, I mean, the results were very lukewarm. We were disappointed until we realized what it was telling us. It was telling us that the messenger matters more than the message in this world we live in, right? So if I'm a conservative and Fox News runs a story, okay, I'm going to tend to believe that story just because I trust Fox News, the messenger, where if I'm liberal, it's sort of the opposite. There's other news output, right? So your question, I'm going to answer your question this way. You have to find the medium, journalist or media, that is reaching the audience that already has credibility and trust with that audience, which I'm telling you has got to be done piecemeal. There are very few universal brands that everyone trusts. It just, that's, that's what those triangles and those crazy plots I was trying to show you, that you do have to get into the weeds. So finding a credible source, and many of us are that, can be that voice in our communities at a local scale. But I'm here to tell you, the minute you get in front of an audience and talk about science, certainly about anything that's going to affect people's lives, the behavior, the first thing they're going to be thinking is, what's in it for them? What are they trying to sell me? You know, people think uh, there's a crisis. Uh, I'll say this, we're running out of time. There's a crisis of expertise in this country right now. We are just collateral damage to that. Do you realize we live in a country where if you're an expert in something, that's actually counted against you? You know, so if I'm here and I'm, I'm you know, I, I represent the teachers union and I'm saying we need to hire more teachers, most of the people in the audience are like, of course you're going to say that. You work for the teachers union. If I'm a scientist saying we need to fund more science, of course, job security. Maybe a nice man, maybe a nice woman, may mean well. But of course, it's in their self-interest to do so. And so one of the things we're exploring is what's called cross-branding. So it's great to have scientists talk about the importance of science, but it's even greater to have artists talk about the importance of science. And plumbers. And ordinary folks who don't have a vested you know, horse in the race. That seems to kind of get through. And in industry does that all the time. Hi, just a quick question. Um, how are we as scientists supposed to make that transition between classroom and market and learn how to brand our science when we as scientists have spent half of our lives in a classroom and that's you know how we've come to be who we are and know what we know. Yeah, so, uh, so you're, you're asking me the, the, the how-to question, right? Which, which is how do you approach it? You know, it, in communication, there are two golden rules. Golden rule number one is know thy audience. So know the people you're talking to and what matters to them. And, you know, listen, which we stink at as scientists. We usually preach. We don't listen. So know your audience. And then know yourself, which is a, a version of the question you asked, which was know how I'm perceived by them so I can cut through kind of the misconceptions. Um, and do it gracefully. So that's a generic answer to your very, very tactical question. We're working very closely with science communication organizations. Um, there's one, the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook. Uh, we're working very closely with them. They're, they're a place that trains scientists to do what you're asking. And it's like a two-day workshop. It's intense. Just to begin that process. So I don't know if I've given you anything useful generically, but I would say we need to listen more. We need to understand who we're talking to. What's your motivation? When you're talking to a group of people in a cafe, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish? And understand that. And understand that beating people over the head with data is generally not going to work. You need to say, look, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're worried about this. I'm here to talk a little bit about it. Or I know you care about this. I'm here to talk about it. Thank you. That's uh, it for the plenary today. Time for lots of workshops and lunch. And those of you who showed up for the jam session last night and who didn't send us your email and contact information, Please do that so that we can keep a list on going. But have a great uh, midday and great talks this afternoon.